Hi, and welcome back. In this lesson, we're going to be covering the CISSP Chapter 6 on Cryptography and Symmetric Key Algorithms. If you're following along with our class schedule, we're going to start getting into file internals with cryptography, instance response, and some ethics and investigation in this unit. Starting out the unit, we're going to be discussing symmetric keys, followed by PKI and some applications and asymmetric keys. Let's get started. To be able to understand about cryptography, first we need to go back to our foundations. Essentially, what is it about cybersecurity that we're trying to do here? Most of us understand the basic CIA, but we're going to add in non-repudiation to that concept. So starting with CIA, confidentiality. The important part about confidentiality, your data should remain private. It should be private while it's at rest, so whether it's stored in a database or in some sort of a um, data storage, whether it's in transit, so on the wire, going between point A and point B, or in your active memory at use when you're using it on your current computer. So data should remain private in all three instances, and we want to make sure that that occurs. We're going to be discussing symmetric and asymmetric crypto systems in this chapter. Mostly we're going to be covering symmetric, but and so asymmetric will be covered mostly in chapter seven, but we will touch on it and help you to understand them. Symmetric crypto systems, we're going to get into a little bit more detail on, but essentially you're going to have a single key that is shared. Whereas asymmetric, you're going to have a pair of keys, a public and a private key. Another concept that we need to make sure we cover is integrity. We want to make sure that the data is not altered without authorization. Obviously, there are times we want to alter our data. That's fine. You're authorized to do that. But you want to make sure that nothing changes in your data when it wasn't authorized, when it wasn't intended. You want to make sure that when you send a file to someone, the file they receive is the same file that was sent to you, sent from the sender. So the sender's file and the receiver's file are the same file. You want to make sure that the data is not altered while it's stored. So essentially nothing happens in the database while it's sitting at rest. And to do those, we use things like digital signatures to make sure that the message is signed and verified when it is sent and when it is received. Another concept we want to follow is authentication. You are who you say you are. We want to make sure that you are authentic, that you are the person that you say you're going to be. We use things called a challenge response protocol to make sure that authenticity gets verified. Essentially, you can ask somebody that you meet, can you tell me about the last time we met? Can you tell me about some piece of personal information that only you and I would know? I'm going to say this, you're going to respond with this, and that way I know that you are the person you say you are. The last concept in foundations that we're going to cover is non-repudiation. Repudiation essentially is derived from the word reputation. You want to make sure that you are being honest about this. The point of non-repudiation is to make sure that you can't claim you didn't do something that you did. We have audit trails, we have logs that verify that you said you were who you said you were and you did this. We want to make sure while we're doing all of this stuff with data that there's no question about who did what. Only asynchronous systems work with non-repudiation. Synchronous systems with a uh, shared secret key you're not going to be able to have that non-repudiation option. And it's a really important thing when you want to make sure that the person who you thought sent you something is actually the person they said they were. That the document that you were received was received from the person who said, who actually was who they said they were. Basic foundations of our cybersecurity and our crypto systems in this chapter. So let's start covering some concepts. First off, there's the concept of plain text. Plain text is simply the message before it's been encrypted. We're going to refer to plain text versus cipher text throughout this chapter. Cipher text is the message after it has been encrypted. So after some encryption has gone on. Our algorithm in the purposes of this lesson is going to be the set of rules that describe the encryption and the decryption process. We're going to discuss a couple of different types of encryption and we're going to be describing the set of rules or the algorithm that is used to implement that encryption. An encryption concept or an encryption system needs to have a key. Usually it's a very large number and we refer to the key in terms of a key space, which is simply the range of values that are valid for the key. 
If I told you that the key could only be between 1 and 10, your key space would be 1 through 10. Most of the time when we're talking about keys for cryptography, we refer to them in powers of 2. 2 to the 1, 2 to the 2, 2 to the 128, 2 to the 64. So we refer to those as a bit key. So 2 to the 128 is 128 bit keys. 2 to the 128, really big number. If you remember your powers of 2, you start getting 2, 4, 6, 8, 16, 32, 64, 128, 256, and keep going up from there. We haven't even gotten to 2 to the 10th yet. 2 to 128, really big number. That means that we use 128 bits of numbers when we store them in binary. So you're always thinking of your keys in terms of how many bits they are. Is it a 64-bit key? Is it a 128-bit key? Is it a 256-bit key? And it's going to be one of these type of numbers. We're going to discuss the different numbers as we go along. But when you think of the key space, we refer to that as anywhere from 0 to that high number. So if it's 2 to the 10th, it'd be 1024. So 0 to 1024. Um, so those are your range or your key space, the possible values for your key. Cryptography is simply the art of creating and implementing secret codes and ciphers, whereas crypto analysis is the study of methods on how to defeat those. Cryptology is simply the study of both of those at the same time, cryptography and crypto analysis all at the same time. There's a couple of standards that we're going to be referencing as we go through. The Federal Info Processing Standard, or FIPS, describes the hardware and software requirements for governments when it comes to cryptography. That's the 140-2. We'll be discussing these in terms of numbers. The reason I'm giving you these is because I do recommend that you go in and you find these actual documents and do the best you can to actually read and understand them. The NIST standards, the FIPS standards, the different standards that we're going to be covering, you want to make sure you understand them because they will change over time. And by understanding where they are documented and who is responsible for keeping track of those standards is part of your job in cybersecurity. You need to stay abreast of all of the new changes. The Kirchhoff's principle describes the concept of crypto systems should still be secure even if everything else is known except the key. There was a time that we talked about cryptography as, as long as nobody knows what the algorithm is, we're fine. We're gonna discuss reasons why that failed over time. But at this point, we are trying to say, it's okay that you know that I used RSA, or you know that I used this version of hashing, or I use this message digest. All of those are fine. It doesn't matter if you know the algorithm. As long as you don't have the key, it is still safe and secure. We're trying to stay away from the idea of secrets and keeping things hidden. As long as you know the algorithm and you don't know the key, you still can't get in. So the basic process that you're going to have in any cryptography is that you're going to essentially take your plain text, your message, hi mom, and you're going to encrypt it. You're going to encrypt it into ciphertext. Once it is ciphertext, you can send it across the wire. It can be safe even if someone reads it. As long as they don't have the key, they don't know what it says. It just says gobbledygook. And then when it gets to the other side, wherever it needs to be, whoever needs to read it, they decrypt it and it's back into plain text so that they can read it. This basic concept of encryption needs to be really understood at a fundamental level for you to understand all of the concepts that come therein. We're going to be discussing some math and different ways in which we implement these algorithms. And I want to make sure you understand that concept of it starts as plain text, moves into cipher text, then is decrypted back down into plain text. In any type of cryptography, we have some mathematics. It's not required for you to be a math major, but you do need to understand some of the fundamental concepts used in the cryptography algorithms to understand our mathematics. So we're going to go over some really basic Boolean um, operators and understanding how that works. Boolean, meaning that it's either a true or a false, yes or no, on or off, one or zero. There's only two answers, yes or no. You can't have a maybe, true or false. You can't have kind of a sometimes, on or off. Can't be kind of halfway in between on and off where you have the little light switch halfway and somehow flickering. No, none of those are options. It's either yes or no, one or zero. Because when Boolean, we're always talking about things going into calculations, which need to be a one or a zero, which is called a bit. So we're going to discuss the concept of truth tables here. Hopefully at some point in your life, you have seen a truth table and these will not be shocking to you. If you haven't, you're going to get them now. So a truth table simply describes if 
A is true and if B is true, then the operator A and B is true because both A and B are true. Are both values true? In the operator of AND, we use this upside down caret, which is the shift six key on your keyboard, but essentially we call it a, a caret or an upside down caret or an, or an A, um, depending on how you want to look at it. And you can see from the truth table, the only way for A and B to occur is if both A and B are true. If A is false, A and B is false, has to, has to be false. If B is false, A and B is false. So A and gives you the question of, are they both true at the same time? So that's our and. For our or, we have a V or an upside down caret um, for the concept of or. Or, from the truth table's point of view, is either A or B true? So if A is true, then A or B is true. And if B is true, A or B is true. Which means out of the four possible options, true, 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 false, false, true, false, false, three of the four will give you a true value, whereas the fourth one will give you a false. So that's or, understanding an or versus an and. The third one is a not. So the not concept, all it does is reverse the value. If A is true, not A is false. If A is false, not A is true. So being able to reverse the value or have the opposite of the value. Remember, we only have two choices here. Either it's true or it's false. There's nothing in between. And the last one is probably the most important for cryptographic math, which, which is a X or or an exclusive or. Either one or the other. So if A is true and B is true, A, X or B is false because both of them are true and it can only be one or the other. If one is true and the other is false, it's true. And if both of them are false, it's false. So the XOR is one of these really important operators that we use in cryptographic math when we do our hashing algorithms and we XOR values on top of other values and on top of other values to end up with some really complicated math, um, a really complicated number at the end of back and forth. And we use these to make sure that things are obfuscated somewhat and they are confused a little bit so that a hacker can't come in and just read it. We're going to XOR against certain values. Now, the great thing about cryptographic math is that when we understand the algorithm, we can go the other direction. So given this value, we XOR it back against B and we can get A back and things like that. So being able to understand the basic fundamentals of cryptographic math, there's a lot more that goes along with Booleans, but these are the basic concepts. And if you understand these, it'll help you a lot as we move forward. A little bit more math, promise, just a little bit more. Modulus or modulo is generally oper uh, given as a percent sign when you're doing it in calculations in um, code. But in this case, the modulus operator, if you remember back to your elementary math, um, when you started learning about long division, you remember how you had a number and you divided it by another number and you ended up with this remainder. And when we were in elementary math, you would write, you know, the answer is six remainder two or something like that. Modulus is an operator that we use in calculations that will tell us instead of the division of two numbers, it will tell us the remainder of two numbers. For the example given here, if you had eight mod six, eight divided by six, you would get one with two left over because you can get six, one six out of eight, and then you end up with two left over. So eight mod six is gonna give you the value of two. Six mod six is gonna give you zero. Seven mod six is gonna give you one. 11 mod 6 is going to give you 5. 12 mod 6 is going to give you back to 0. Because remember, we're going to be essentially what is the remainder when you do the division. We don't care about the actual division. We just care about the remainder. And again, this is one of those really, really common functions that we use in cryptographic math to make sure that we can do some mathematics on it. It really is kind of powerful. We also need to be able to create what are called one-way functions, functions that are really easy to take this function and apply it to a number and get another number out. However, from that other number, it's impossible to go the other direction. For example, with modulus, if I give you that the output of x mod y is going to be three, you can't tell me what x and y were. In fact, I could even give you y, y is 18 you can't tell me what x was. That's one of the cool things about one-way functions. We use it significantly in hashing, and we'll be talking about hashing as we get further along. But hashing is all about being able to do a one-way function. Really easy to get the number out, 
for the output, really difficult to go the other direction. Almost impossible. There's some conversation about being able to pull it off and come up with different ways of dehashing. But in general, right now, it's very, very difficult, if not impossible, to do the reverse, getting the input from the output. Too many possible options. We often refer to a nonce as a piece of randomness. It's, it's a thing. It's a one-time piece of information randomized that we use when processing. We can also refer to it as salting, adding randomness to the information. We can take a piece of information, a data um, piece of data, and we can XOR it with a nonce, or we can add a nonce into it and then XOR it and then hash it. And adding in that piece of randomness makes it very difficult, again, to go the other direction and unhash um, it. So it's sometimes just a one-time random number that we add in when processing to make sure. We also can sometimes call this a seed or an initialization vector, piece of information that we can start with and be able to move forward from when we do our calculations. A zero knowledge proof. Okay, there's a great picture in the book, which I didn't have space on the slide to throw in there. But when you get to the book, there's this piece of information of how do you prove that you know something without telling you the thing that I know. I know X, I know the next lottery numbers, whatever it happens to be. How do you know that I know that if unless I tell you what they are? And I can't tell you what they are because then you'll go win the lottery and I won't win it and that will be sad. So I need to prove that I know something without telling you the thing that I know. This is called a zero knowledge proof. There actually is a mathematical way to do this. And again, it goes into it in the book, the concept of being able to walk around a circle and go through the door and you can see that I come out the other side of the door. Um, but it's essentially a zero knowledge proof means I can prove that I know it without telling you what it is and enough that you will believe me that I know it. We're going to go into why we need to know about the zero knowledge proof as we go further. Okay, so those are the basic functions. A couple of concepts. A split knowledge simply means two-person control. We do this a lot with separation of duties. Um, if you've ever had an old-fashioned you know, checkbook where you had to sign it, there were times that you had to have two signatures on it. Two-person control. Two people have pieces of information. Sometimes you can take the key, split the key in half. One half is held by one person, one half is held by the other person. Neither person alone can use the key. Put the two keys together, now you can use it. So we call this split knowledge. Take the piece of information and split it in half. We can choose to store our key in escrow. Escrow means that a third party, called a recovery agent, is holding on to the key just in case something bad happens. When you go to buy a house, you generally put your money in escrow. You are giving it to a third party. You don't want to give it to the party that you're going to buy the house from yet because they haven't given you the house. Once they've signed all the documents and now the house is yours, the escrow agent releases your information to them and then everybody's happy. But if for whatever reason they don't give you the house or the house is not what you expected, the escrow agent can give you back the key and you aren't out anything except maybe a little escrow fee. When we talk about split knowledge, we use an M of N control concept. If we have a minimum of three agents out of eight total, so a, a three of eight control means that you have to have at least three people out of the eight that give enough information to be able to solve the problem. So we can call that M of N control. If you just have one person with all of the knowledge, they can just do it on their own and you have possibilities for corruption and other issues going on. Three of eight or four of six or two of six or something along those lines, make sure that you have at least some version of split knowledge. And our last option on this slide is going to be our work function. When we talk about cryptography, we want to know how much effort is it going to take to brute force this attack. We've talked before on password sec security and being able to have length of passwords. So if I have a four digit pin, there are only 10,000 possible options. Well, not even that many, 9,000 and change. Um, because you can have, you know, one or zero, 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 zero. You can have zero, 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 one. You can have zero, zero, two. Now I guess it's 9,999. Um, so 10,000 options. You could have 9999. You could have any variation therein. So it's going to take you 10,000 steps to be able to brute force and try every single value of a pin to be able to make it work. 
Now, fortunately, our debit cards usually lock out after three invalid pins, so you don't have the option of entering in 10,000, but that's at least a work function that gives you how much cost and time is it going to take you to brute force this. It's going to take me the time it takes me to run 10,000 iterations of this choice. You want to make sure when you are thinking about cryptography and you're thinking about your algorithms and you're thinking about why you're going to use this algorithm over another and this key length over another, you want to make sure that the amount of effort that you have to put into creating your keys, dealing with the cryptography, doing this algorithm this way or the other way, that the effort is related to the value of the asset. Now, if we're talking about opening your refrigerator, I really don't need to put a whole lot of cryptography into that. I really don't care who gets into my refrigerator, so I'm not going to put some effort into that. If you're going to be sending a message to your mom that says, hi, mom, I'm on my way, um, I'll be there in 20 minutes, you really don't need to worry about encrypting that too much. I mean, what are they going to do with that piece of information? Unless, of course, that's really important information for you. Now, if we're talking about nuclear launch codes, that's something you want to put a lot of effort into because, you know, the risk of somebody bad getting hold of it is going to be a little bit higher than is someone going to find out I'm going to be at my mom's house in 10 minutes. So you always want to think about the work function, how much effort, cost and time, could be cost, could be time, could be both, could be one or the other, to brute force this attack. What is it going to take? And make sure that that's commiserate with whatever the valuation of the asset is that you are protecting. No reason to waste a huge amount of energy on cryptography on assets that aren't that important to be able to protect. If it's company trade secrets, yeah, that's probably something you want to protect. If it's whether or not we're going to have cookies or cake at the next dinner, that's probably not that important. So you always want to think about that work function and think about how that's going to affect how much effort to put into your cryptography. We're now going to get into the difference between ciphers and codes. You've heard a lot of codes in your life. Code is simply a symbol or a word to represent a group of words, but it's not always intended to be secret. Like code blue means someone's not breathing. Code red, there's a fire. Um, different codes, 10-4, good buddy. Different things that we use that mean different things. Police department uses codes to reference different types of crimes. They're not a secret. People usually can tell if they hear this code or that code, they can usually figure out what that is. So it's not intended to be a secret when it's a code. Sometimes it is, but a lot of times it's not. A cipher, on the other hand, is a technique or an algorithm designed to alter or rearrange characters for the purposes of achieving confidentiality. It's intended to be secret. Its purpose is always secret. Codes can be simply a shortened way of referring to something so that people know what we're talking about without having to use those actual words. Ciphers are always about confidentiality, which is why we refer to ciphertext as the encrypted text that we do when we're doing encryption. So when you hear the word cipher, always think secret. It is something we're trying to try to keep secret, unless of course you're referencing the matrix. When we talk about codes and ciphers, we refer to the concepts of confusion and diffusion. So confusion makes the relationship between the plain key or the plain text and the key so complicated that you can't just change around the cipher text to determine the key. Sometimes you can, and there are different reasons why when we start getting into different types of ciphers. Diffusion means that we're doing multiple changes throughout the cipher text. So we're doing a substitution, then a transposition, then another substitution, then another, subst another substitution in there too. So we're doing multiple changes as we go through. By using both some confusion, making the plain text and the key relationships so complicated that nobody can really figure out how they're related, and diffusion by using multiple changes, we can make our algorithm in such a way that it's very difficult for someone to decrypt it. Listed below are a couple of different types of ciphers that we are going to be discussing. We'll discuss each one of these in turn, but to give you as a list, transposition, substitution, one-time pads, running keys, block ciphers, and then stream ciphers. So we're going to go through and describe each one in the next couple of slides. Starting with transposition. Transposition is rearranging the letters of the message by using some sort of a key. So in the example here of our key, we have a key of attacker. 
if we were to alphabetize the letters in this key, we would get A, A, then C, then E, then K, then R, then T, and T. Left to right, you can see the letters and the numbers underneath them that reference what um, order they are in when alphabetizing them. So I've given you the key. Now I have given you the ordering of the letters. Underneath the key, we are going to line up our message underneath it into rows and columns. So my message is going to be the fight, the fighters will strike the enemy base at noon. Sorry. Um, so we're going to line up the whole message underneath there. We keep it all as uppercase because it doesn't matter. We could choose to make it lowercase, but it really doesn't matter. Keep it all uppercase. And we're going to write it all out this way. Now, this is where the transposition con concept comes in. We're rearranging the letters of the message. All of the letters of the message are still in the message. That isn't the question. The question is, how, what is the order they're in and can they be read? Well, if I know what my key is and I know that this is how it's going to be read, I can now look at everything under line one, so the first A, and write those letters, T-E-T-E-E. -E -E. That is the first column under the one. Now I'm going to go to the column number two, the other A, as we move further along, F-W-K-M-T. Those are going to be my next five letters. So you can see, as I'm reading the actual ciphertext down at the bottom, T-E-T-E-E-F-W-K-M-T. -E -E then we go to the three, which is that C, I-I-E-Y-N. Then we go to four, which is that E, so the seventh column, and we're going to get H L H. O or A O, then we will go to the fifth column and so on and so forth. As you can see, the ciphertext, what you get at the end, is completely illegible. If you did not know the key, you would not be able to just easily rearrange this and make it work. Now, you probably could figure it out if you knew that this was a transposition cipher and you could say, okay, well, I'm going to count up all of my letters. I'm going to figure out that each column has five letters in it. I'm going to arrange all of my five columns. Then I just need to kind of switch them until it might make sense. And after a little bit of effort, you probably could figure it out. It's not a really good version with this key and this small bit of a, a, a um, version, but if you didn't know that it was transposition, that would be great because how else would you know? Now you've got all these letters in here. What words can I make out of these letters and how would I make that work? Transposition simply means we are rearranging the orders of the letters. Okay. Substitution. This is back all the way back to ancient times with the Caesar cipher, but essentially this is probably something you did with your friends in elementary school. We are going to replace each character with a different character. So the Caesar cipher, which was a rotation of three, which meant that for every A, we're going to put in a D, and for every B, we're going to put in an E, and for every C, we're going to put in an F, and so on and so forth. Being able to rearrange by replacing each character with a different character, substitution. For example, the die has been cast would be W, K, H, G, L, H, K, D, V, so on and so forth. When we use a mathematical formula to explain this, we are going to say that the cipher text is equal to the plain text plus three and then mod 26. Because when you get to the last couple of numbers, you're going to plus three, you're going to get over 26, and you're going to end up with Z being back to being B or C, whichever one, uh, Z would be C, um, rotating three. So we use the formula of cipher equals plain plus three, and then mod it by 26. Each of the characters, if you could think of them in terms of um, numbers, where A would be zero, and B would be one, and C would be two, you can see how we would add those and then mod it by 26. What is the remainder when divided by 26? The remainder for most of the numbers will be just be its number, and that will be the cipher that we're going to pick. The reason I'm spending a lot of energy on trying to explain this formula is because we use the formula in like four other different types of ciphers, and I want to make sure you get it now, although I'll try to explain it as we see each one. Substitution in and of itself, a basic rotation of three or a Caesar cipher, is really easy to crack with frequency analysis because, as we know, the letter E is the most frequent letter. 
So if you see the number, you know, L as the most frequent letter, we know that that's probably an E. And then we can use that to cipher the rest of it and figure out if it was just rotated or if everything was, was actually a different letter. So they came up with a couple of different ways to fix this. One was the Vignari system, which uses a key with multiple alphabets. So in this example, we have, you can see the example with the A's on the top and then the A's, A through um, G on the side. And we look at both the plain text and the key, and we find the letter that is in the cell where the row and the column meet. So we convert the key and the plain text into a row column issue. In the example here, if the plain text is launched now and the key is miles, we're just gonna repeat miles, 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 or smile, <laughs> I think it's mile, uh, miles. So we're gonna put miles and then the L and the M, put the L on the row side and the M on the column side and you will get the letter X. And then the A on the row side and the I on the column side and you will get I, and then the U, and then the N, and then the C, and so on and so forth, until you get your new um, ciphertext. This is not a simple substitution. This is, a, this is a secondary substitution, a way to resolve the problem of frequency analysis to be able to solve your cipher. So if I have my ciphertext and I use the Svignari system, it makes it so that it's much more difficult to crack because it isn't always plus three. Sometimes it's plus three, sometimes it's plus eight, sometimes it's plus two, and it really depends on what the key is to be able to figure those out. So that's your basic substitution cipher. You can have a Caesar, which was the rotation of three, you can make it rotation of eight, make a rotation of 20, and that's fine, a simple rotation substitution. Or you can simply have every character represented by a different character, still substitution, just may not be following a straight um, Caesar cipher rotation as opposed to just a straight substitution. Always can be expressed as a mathematical formula, which is what makes it so powerful with computers. Our next cipher is a one-time pad. Now, one-time pads were extremely, and still are, extremely secure. But the problem with a one-time pad is it is a substitution cipher with a little kick. Every single letter has a random change, which means you have the, the imagery of a pad or essentially multiple numbers randomly created. So if your message is 20 characters long, you have a pad of 20 randomly created character or letters um, or numbers, essentially the random change for each letter. In this case, that mathematical formula of the ciphertext equals the plain text plus the key mod 26, because we have to figure out which character it's going to be. It's still a substitution character, but that pad is your key. Each pad is only used once, and the substitution for each letter has to be random. It cannot follow a pattern to be a one-time pad. And obviously, the pad must be protected, so you have to protect the key. Well, if I can get you securely the key, then and I can only use it once, then is that easier or harder than just giving you the encryption of whatever the message is? And the pad has to be as long as the message. Always the length of the message, obviously, because each character in the message needs to have whatever its number is from the pad. So the pad is going to list out 2, 4, 9, 12, 16, 42, whatever the different numbers are that we're going to do for that randomness. And then we're going to add those in to make um, our random cipher. So that's our one-time pad. There's a problem with the one-time pad. If it is not random, if you're using something and somebody figures out what that something is, that decreases your, your security. Also, if it, you use the same pad twice, as soon as you start to use the same pad twice, people can do analysis based on the ciphertext to figure it out. There are a couple of examples in the book, the, Verona, the Venona Russian project, um, goes through and describes one of the Russian problems where they had used a one-time pad, but they had repeated using it and it became a problem. We were able to crack it. There's also a link to the crypto museum, which runs into a couple of examples on the one-time pad and different ways in which it's used. I recommend you look through both of them because they're both really, really useful. The other cipher on this slide is going to be your running key. The running key is the same thing as a one-time pad, except always an except it uses a book or some other premium or printed medium. So it's easier than one-time pad. 
this is where I could tell you I'm going to pick this book. I don't know. I think the example here was Moby Dick. Um, I'm going to choose this book. You and I both know what book it is. All you have to know is know what the book is. And then I can tell you we're going to start with paragraph two um, on page six. Cool. Paragraph two, page six. That's where we're starting. And then I can read from the book in the example here. With much interest, I sat watching him, savage though he was, and hideously marred, was my key, which I read from this page, this paragraph, starting at this character, and go. Ignore spaces, ignore new line characters, and just get all the characters, and now you suddenly have what is essentially a one-time pad, except you're getting it out of a book, which is a little easier than trying to remember an entire one-time key um, each time. So as long as you know what the book is and I know what the book is, I could even tell in plain text, page six, line 42. And as long as you know the book and I know the book and nobody else knows the book, that doesn't tell them anything because there's enough books out there that it's hard to be able to find a book that, you know, you could just automatically do unless the person knows enough about you and I to know which book we're going to pick. So a running key is also known as a book cipher. It's the one where you use a book and you have a starting point in the book and then you use the characters in the book as your key. The numbers that are given here are just to help you to understand the mathematics. Remember, the numbered plain text, so we're going to say R is the 17th character, W is the 22nd character. So we're going to go 17 plus 22, which is 39, mod 26, and you end up with 13. This is where getting comfortable with modding, essentially take the number, divide it by, or subtract 26 is the same thing. Um, in this case, as long as the number isn't going to go over um, 52. But do that mathematics, add them together, find out what the, the summation mod 26 is, and that's going to be your new letter. In this case, was N, which is the 13th character, so on and so forth throughout. So that is a running key um, cipher. It's really important to be able to recognize when you are talking about a cipher, whether or not you're using a block cipher or a stream cipher. There's a difference. So a block cipher operates on blocks or chunks, usually like a word or a section of the message at a time. We are going to change the ordering of the letters of each word. So we're just going to take the word and we're going to munch the letters of that word. Then we're going to go to the next word and we're going to munch the letters of that word. We're going to be doing this on an individual block or we're going to be doing a 64-bit block of your message and munch those. And then we're going to go to the next 64-bit block and we're going to munge those. And we're going to change the orders of the letters of each word or something like that so that we can do them on blocks. Individual blocks or chunks of the message at each time. So we take our plain text, we break it out into block one, block two, block three, encrypt each block, and then end up with cipher one, cipher two, cipher three, then concatenate them all together and get cipher one, two, three. That's a block cipher. A stream cipher operates on either one character or one bit of a message at a time. So a Caesar cipher works on each character, one time pad, stream ciphers. They work on one character at a time. You can do them as blocks as well if you're going to be working with a buffer. But essentially, a stream cipher allows you to do each character's encryption rather than each word's encryption to break them up into blocks. I'm using the word word. Word is kind of ambiguous for simply a collection of characters or a collection of bits or a chunk of the message at a time. It could be seven words, and that's a chunk. It could be a half of a word and a half of a word, and that could be a chunk. So I'm using the word word very ambiguously here. It doesn't mean literally the word I and the word me and the word the. It could, or it could be something else that it's breaking up into, just simply blocks or chunks. We're going to refer to them as words, but in this case, I don't want you to get too hung up on the concept of a word as more of it is a chunk, multiple characters, multiple bits at one time, rather than a single character or a single bit at a time, differentiating between a block and a stream cipher. Back in the early days of cryptography, we followed the basic concept of security through obscurity. Don't let the bad guys know what you're doing. If they know the algorithm, they can crack it. If we know you just did a substitution algorithm, that's pretty easy. Once we know that, it suddenly makes it really easy for us to be able to crack it because we know that's what you did. Modern principles of cryptography want you to follow the concept that everything about what you're doing can be public except the key. 
keep the key se se secret, but everything else can be public, which means you can document for the purposes of regulations or government or even documentation for your shareholders. This is the algorithm I'm using to secure my data. That doesn't help the bad guys. It doesn't help the hackers and the attackers to know that I'm using RSA cryptography. If anything, it makes it easier because or it makes it harder for them, but it, I mean, it makes it better because people are able to go in there and make sure that that public scrutiny of that algorithm is still valid. Because we're telling them, I'm gonna use this algorithm, this RSA and crypto cryptography or encryption, everybody can look at the algorithm and go, yeah, that works. Or now, wait a minute, here, I found a way that that doesn't work. We need to fix it, we need to change that. And over time, we have done that. We have found different types of cryptography that we have said no longer are effective because they're too open or there's too many ways that people can break through them. So we want to always follow the modern principle of everything can be available. That doesn't mean go brag about it. I mean, you could if you wanted to say I'm the most secure because I'm using this algorithm. But in general, everything could be available and public. As long as the key is still private, you are safe. We do know that way back when this started, some encryption standards were pretty weak comparatively. At the time, they were pretty strong. So DES, DES back in 1975 used a 56 bit key. That was really secure at the time, knowing what the processing power is of what computers in 1975 were. However, as our processing power got stronger, bigger, faster computers, we can brute force a 56-bit key pretty stinking fast. So we don't use DES anymore. It's basic DES. You have to use at least 128 or 256-bit key required now because you want to make sure that they're long enough. And as you get them longer and longer, it is much more difficult to break them. A 56-bit key, pretty easy to break. 128, 256, 1024, much more difficult to break. You always want to make sure that your keys are long enough to avoid being broken, brute force attacks. So when you think about how much effort you're going to put in back to that work function, you want to be able to make sure your keys are long enough. From the concept of making your cybersecurity system, you need to make sure that you always store your keys securely, obviously, whether those are stored in a location or whether they are memorized or whether in some way they are um, hashed and stored in some way. However you want to handle storing your keys, make sure that they are stored securely. If you can avoid transmitting any of your keys over the internet, do that. So avoid transmitting over the internet if you're able to. Sometimes you're not, and we'll talk about different ways with asymmetric encryption and cryptography to be able to transmit over the internet as in a secure tunnel or in some way. But for right now, just try to avoid transmitting if you don't have to. Personally identifiable information, trade secrets, don't transmit them over the internet just because that's a way that hackers can get in. You want to select your keys with as much randomness as possible. You don't want to pick your wife's birthday. You don't want to pick your kid's middle name. Um, randomness. Find some randomness because randomness makes it much more difficult to hack. Definitely with social engineering, if they know which school you went to, they can probably figure out what your, your um, school was, what your mascot was, so on and so forth. So try to use, select your keys with randomness. And most importantly, when you don't need your key anymore, destroy it, get rid of it, change it. We do this in, in companies sometimes where we just say every six months, every three months, you have to get a new key. And you can't use a key that's the same as your last key where you just change the one to a two. That's still pretty much the same key as far as randomness. So one of the things hackers can do is if they can find your old key, it's pretty easy for them to try a couple variations on that to see if they can get their your new key. We'd like to avoid that. So make sure that you destroy your keys. Don't just like throw them out in the, in the trash, but actually destroy your keys when they're no longer needed. Okay, so the first we're gonna talk about is symmetric key encryption. Symmetric key encryption is where both the sender and the receiver have the same key. They both know the key. We also can call this a shared secret or secret key encryption or cryptography and private key cryptography. Private meaning it's private between just you and I. We're the only two people that know the key and it's private between us. This is going to get confusing when we do asymmetric key in the next slide. But private key encryption means that it's private and you and I both know the key and nobody else does. We can choose to use temporary keys that are only used for one session, which we call ephemeral meaning that it's going to go away over time. So we're only going to use it for one session. And this is the kind that is used in TLS, which we will discuss in chapter seven. So 
Temporary keys are an option when we have the ability to create a single key for a session, make the tunnel session, go ahead and create it, give the TLS um, and, and this encryption using a single secret key for the purposes of this session. When you have a secret key, both the sender and the receiver start with their plain text or the sender starts with the plain text, uses the encryption algorithm with a secret key and gets the crypto text, sends it to the receiver. The receiver takes the crypto text, decrypts it using the secret key and gets back to the plain text. Great. Problems with symmetric keys. How many keys do you need? So we talk about this and there's this great um, number in the book of how many keys are necessary when you have symmetric key encryption. If you have five people in your company, the number of keys is going to be all five people with the four people that they need to talk to divided by two because John talks to Mary and Mary talks to John. So they have one set, one key for the two of them. And then John talks to Joseph and Joseph and John have a, a, a set. And then everybody ends up with the N number of parties. And then you do N and minus one divided by two because each pair of people, pe each pair of people have a separate key. Once you start getting into large numbers of people, this does not scale well. It starts getting into the thousands and the tens of thousands of keys that you have to keep track of. And that's just kind of a pain. So using symmetric key with a large number of people is really complicated. So the strengths of symmetric key so much faster. Oh my gosh, a thousand to 10,000 times faster than asymmetric encryption. So secret key, so much faster. You can do hardware implementations, makes it faster. Awesome. However, key distribution, huge problem. How do we get everybody their own keys? There is no non-repudiation because since both parties have the secret key, you can't verify which one of the two parties did the encryption or the decryption for that matter, because they both have the same key. So you, you can't guarantee that you did whatever it is you said you would, you would do. It wasn't that it was always sent by you, could be sent by the other party. Very difficult to scale, again, with that key number. And they actually have to be regenerated often because as soon as somebody misses something or something like that, we have to set up a new set of keys and go through the key distribution again for that. So symmetric keys are really difficult because of this key distribution issue, the non-repudiation issue, and the scalability, but they are really, really efficient and fast when actually sending information. Now let's talk about asymmetric keys. In asymmetric keys, there are two keys for each user. Each individual user gets two keys. He has a public key and a private key. So I am Cheryl and Cheryl has Cheryl's public key and Cheryl's private key. I'm the only one who knows my private key. It's kept secret. I'm the only one who knows my private key. My public key, everybody else can know. I don't care if it's you or you or you. Every one of you can know my public key. That's fine. I don't care. The way it works is if you want to send something to me that only I can open, that only I can decrypt. You take your plain text and you encrypt it with my public key, Cheryl's public key, the one that everybody has. You encrypt it with that and you end up with a cipher text. Because of the mathematics of asymmetric key encryption, you can't decrypt it with my public key. That's the thing used to encrypt it. You can't decrypt it with that key. The only thing that is used to decrypt it is my private key and I'm the only one who knows that. So I receive it. I use my private key to decrypt it. And now I can see the plain text. So private or asymmetric key has a public and a private key. I know my private and I can share my public with everybody. The public key is the one that's used to encrypt the message, which anybody can do because anybody can send me a message that's encrypted. And I'm the only one who can decrypt it. This one, the number of keys is simply two times the number of people. So if there's a thousand people, it's just 2000 keys. Each person has two, has two keys. They have their public and their private and everybody can know all of the publics and everybody keeps their private keys separate. And that's the only private key that they need to know. So much less keys for large numbers of people, which is great for asymmetric key. So more keys, removing users is easy because you just take out those two keys. Keys only need to be gen regenerated if they're compromised. So if I lose my private key, I can regenerate both my public and my private key, share my public key out with everybody, still keep my private, and that's all I need to do. None of the other keys need to change and nobody else needs to change their life. You can do non-repudiation, which means I can verify that I'm the one who opened it. And there's a way that we can use um, asymmetric keys where you are the only one who can encrypt with your private key 
and anybody can decrypt it with the public key. However, the non-repudiation enforces that you're the only one who encrypted it, which means you're the one who did it. That was the point of non-repudiation, to make sure you did it. So there's a way that we use both your public, your private, my public, and my private to be able to make sure that we have non-repudiation and integrity and confidentiality all at the same time. Distribution is pretty easy. And there is no pre-existing link that's required. It isn't necessary that you know me and that I know you and that we met somewhere and we passed some pieces of information between the two of us. I can have my public key public available out there and anybody can send me something and there doesn't need to be that link. So asymmetric key is great for this. However, again, really slow comparatively to symmetric. Not really slow when you consider how fast our computers are, but slow. And what we do is we use a hybrid cryptography to be able to use a symmetric uh, connection using asymmetric keys to get us started. We'll talk about that when we get into hybrid pretty pretty quickly here. So to compare symmetric with asymmetric, symmetric has a single shared key as opposed to asymmetric that has a key pair, two keys. Symmetric can be used for out of band exchange, whereas asymmetric is usually an in band exchange. Symmetric is not very scalable, whereas asymmetric is very scalable, but symmetric is fast and asymmetric is slow. Symmetric is used for block or for bulk encryption, whereas asymmetric is usually done for very small blocks of data, maybe dig digital signatures or certificates, very small pieces of data, not too many bits comparatively. Symmetric gives you confidentiality, but asymmetric gives you confidentiality, integrity with hashing, authenticity, and non-repudiation through digital signatures. Again, we'll get into asymmetric in chapter seven, so we're not gonna spend too much time discussing it in this chapter, but it's always good to see the comparison between the two. Now we're gonna discuss hashing. So for those of you that understand hashing, this will be like, you can almost ignore this slide. Hashing is this ability to take pieces of information, run them through a function, and receive a fixed length result at the end, which we call a message digest. The great thing about hashing, and we sometimes call them a hash value or maybe the fingerprint of the input, it is essentially a summary of the content that we use the hashing algorithm to create. Hashing is exceedingly difficult to reverse, to get to start from your digest and end up with your input. Even if you know what the hash function is, it's still really difficult to do. It's unlikely to produce the same hash value without the original message, but it is possible. We call these collisions. They become a problem with some of our hashing algorithms that we use. And again, we'll get into that when we get into more hashing. The great thing about hashing is that very small changes make significant changes in the digest. As the example is here, the input of Fox gives you this digest. Now, the funny thing about the digest that you laugh at is Fox has three letters and the digest is, what is that, 10, four bit, so 20 characters. Um, I'm sorry, 40 characters um, in the digest for a three letter word. That's okay. The digest is exactly the same size each time. Now you notice the red fox jumps over the blue dog again, gives us 40 characters. Um, yeah, using the same hash function, but they're completely different. In fact, you can't find the word fox in the digest because it's not there. The red fox jumps over spelled wrong with a U instead of the O and none of it looks the same. As you can see, none of the digests between one and the other looks the same. I've only changed one letter. The red fox jumps over where the V and the E are um, inverted. Again, we haven't even changed a letter. We've just switched to completely different digest. And then the red fox jumps over missing the V, so losing one letter, still can't tell. So looking at the digest, you can't tell what the original input was and there's no way to get it back. That's the benefit, this huge awesomeness that is hashing. Now, the great thing is because of the way that it uses modulus and um, different mathematical formulas in there with X's, XORs and ands and ors and nots, um, you can end up with a 40 character digest no matter what you started as your input because that's how the algorithm works. So you could have 300 characters and you could have three characters and you're still going to end up with a 40 character digest, which is really useful. So this is the basics of hashing. We're not going to get into how you do the actual hash function. If you are interested, there are plenty of examples out there on how to fat, how to write a hash function. And we'll get into that again in chapter seven when we get into a little bit more about our hashing function options.
At this point, we're going to start describing the different symmetric modes, cryptographic modes. It is really quite important for you to try to memorize. There's about six or seven of them that you have to kind of recognize the letters, the acronym, and what they mean. Because part of these questions are going to be on your CISSP exam, and they're going to ask you, is it a cipher blockchain? Is it a feedback? Is it an electronic code book? How is it going to be used? So if you're going to, you know, which one would you use that's going to do this? It's really important for you to understand those different modes. So we're going to start with the easiest one, the electronic code book or the ECB. Again, the acronym usually goes with the name, so if you can see the acronym and get back to the name, you should be useful here in figuring out what it's going to be doing. The electronic code book is the easiest to understand, but it's also the least secure. We work on 64-bit blocks, blocks, not streams, blocks, that are all encrypted with the same key. Same block gives you the same cipher. These are really impractical for anything but a short transmission, so perhaps sending your, your key sending some parameters, sending some small data, but they're also very, very insecure because it's the same cipher every time you get the same block, which means if I see the same block three times, I might be able to figure out the cipher after that and be able to break it. So electronic code books, understanding what they do and how they're used, kind of useful. Then we move on to a cipher block chain. This is where we get into that math. Each block is XORed with the previous block. So remember XOR is where if x or if a is true and b is false then it's true and if a is false and b is false then it's false remember our xor with our truth tables back there so each block is xored with the previous block we start with an iv and xor with that with the initialization initialization vector um, and xor that with the first block and then each subsequent block is xored with the previous block the problem with Cypher blockchain is if you screw up something somewhere, anywhere in your block chain, everything thereon will be corrupted. So if you're, if you have 20 blocks and your third block was corrupted, everything from the third block on is going to be wrong because we're using these mathematical formulas to figure this out. So it's really impossible to decrypt if anything got corrupted or lost in the transmission. But the blocks are XORed with the previous block, which makes them much more difficult to break than the basic electronic code book. The cipher feedback is a cipher blockchain, but it uses the streaming version instead of the block version. So remember we did blocks as opposed to streaming. Streaming does individual memory buffers instead of blocks. So it's filling up a buffer and then it's encrypted and sent, but we can do it in real time rather than being pre-created. If you were doing the pre-created one to be able to do the cipher blockchain, you have to look at each block as you go along. But with the cipher feedback, we can real-time data as it goes through. Fill in the buffer with our memory, encrypt it, send it, fill the buffer, send it. Um, so it uses memory buffers instead of individual blocks. Our output feedback is similar to our um, cipher feedback. Except instead of XORing with the previous cipher, it's XORed with a seed value. And then the future seeds are determined from an algorithm. So we're going to start from a single seed and then we're going to XOR it with the next number in the seed and then it's going to keep moving along. So there's no propagation of those transmission errors. It's not chained anymore. Each block is handled individually based on the seed for that block. But because there's no chaining, if I, if I said, and you would never do this, but if your seed value was 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, I would know that if I was in my fourth block that the seed value is 4, and in my fifth block the seed value is 5. And again, you would never use those numbers, but the, the concept being that the seeds are already, um, or the individual XOR that it's going to be um, XORed with is going to be a value that could be understood by both sides using the seed value. So there's no chaining in output feedback. There's no propagation of transmission errors in output feedback. Then we go to counter. Counter, similar, again, to um, the feedback and the output feedback. But instead of using a seed value, we do use a simple counter for incrementation. So again, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. But this is great for breaking it up into parallel computing. So if you can imagine, we know ahead of time 
what my next counter is going to be. I can push out, you're going to do these 10, you're going to do these 10, you're going to do these 10 and do parallel computing on this, break it up and we, are, and we won't have any propagation of errors. But instead of using a basic seed value, you're going to use a counter to increment. So that's counter. We call it a counter. Then we throw in the Galios counter, which is the GCM, which is a little bit weird. It uses a counter, but it adds in data authenticity to the encryptions. So that adds in some more pieces of information that are going to be part of it rather than simply a counter. Along with this is the counter with cipher block chaining message authentication code, which is just way too many letters, and we wanted to make it three, so we made it a CCM. We use the counter for confidentiality and the CBC for authenticity. It requires both a 128-bit block and a nonce or a piece of random information that we are going to add in there. So you're going to be doing the, the blockchain and the counter to be able to add both authenticity and confidentiality to your cryptographic mode. Seven different modes. Yes, in your exam, there will be, if you're doing the CFB, do you know what CFB is? And you wanna to try to keep those straight and remember which ones are which. So now we're gonna start working in the DES or data encryption standard. Okay. DES was originally created by the U.S. government in 1977. It used 64-bit block ciphers and a 56-bit key with 8 bits of parity info. Yes, I realize I said 64-bit, then 56-bit, and you're like 56 and 64 are not the same number. You're right. We had to add in that parity info to make sure that we could handle errors, so we only have a 56-bit key. When you think of the original DES, stick with that 56 number. 56-bit key for the original DES. It used a series of XOR operations 16 times for each encryption, which we each called those a round, 16 rounds. Every time you do a round, you do an XOR operation and you generate a new key. And then you XOR against that key and then you generate a new one and then you generate a new key and you generate a new one and you XOR against it again. You did this 16 times. This was the original DES. And it was pretty effective for a while but it isn't good enough anymore. 56 bit key is just way too easy to break and too many people, yeah, have too much information about how to, how to brute force a DES. So we don't do that anymore. What we did is we made triple DES, an adapted version of DES that's stronger, still not really good enough. It uses 168 bit key. We moved up from there and we changed things a little bit. When we use triple DES, we use three different keys, key one, key two, and key three. Understanding how triple DES is used is we can have the DES EDE, or we can have the triple the DES EEE. -E. The way we differentiate these is we make a function that takes one of the keys and the plain text and it encrypts them. So we're gonna do the EDE first. So encrypt, decrypt, encrypt, encrypt. We're gonna start by encrypting key three with my plain text. Then we're going to use that value as the plain text for a decryption, so EDE, -E, using key two to decrypt it. Then we're going to use key one to encrypt the resulting value of that. So we're going to do this kind of three leveled keys to be able to do DES with EDE. -E. With EEE, -E, we're encrypting all the way across. So encrypt with key three, then take the resulting value from that and encrypt with key two, and then take the resulting value from that and encrypt in key one. That makes your ciphertext. So these are different variations of triple DES, which again, you need to understand if I tell you that it is DES EDE, -E, you need to know that that EDE -E stands for encrypt, decrypt, e encrypt, and it uses three keys and it's a triple DES version. So keeping track of those. The last DES standard that we're going to talk about is the IDEA, the International Data Encryption Algorithm, which uses a 64-bit block of plain text with a 128-bit key, but our 128-bit key is broken into 52 different 16-bit subkeys. The subkeys work with that XOR and the modulus, and we use this for pretty good privacy, the PGP standard for email. So being able to use the IDEA standard. Um, the idea that you have 64-bit blocks, 
128-bit key that's broken into 52 16-bit subkeys is the part about idea that you want to keep straight in your head. Again, most standards are going to use some version of modulus and XOR to be able to make the encryption standard work. Two more versions, well, there's a couple more, of DES standards. Bruce Schneider came up with a block standard as an alternative to basic DES and IDEA that he called Blowfish. It is 64 blocks of text with variable length keys. So the key could be anywhere from 32 to 448 bits for the key. The longer the key, the more secure, but the longer that it takes to decrypt or encrypt. It was released to the public with no licensing. Bruce Schneider just allowed everybody to use it as opposed to everything else being patented and licensed and people wanting to get credit for it. Bruce Schneider just opened up Blowfish straight away and said, this is my algorithm, go for it if you want. Skipjack is one that the U.S. government, using Federal Information Processing Standard, or FIPS 185, is used to do escrow encryption standards of EES. It uses a 64-bit block with an 80-bit key. This supports the escrow of encryption keys. Remember the concept of escrow encryption keys means that some third party is holding it? Yeah, the NIST and the Department of Treasury are holding the ability to handle the or to reconstruct those keys. That escrow is being held at the Department of Treasury and then with NIST. And therefore, Skipjack is perhaps used for government purposes, but people are really having a hard time using it in the public in the private sector because they do understand that the government holds the ability to reconstruct those keys. We do use both the Clipper and the Kips Capstone chips with the Skipjack standard. So that's the standard that's currently using those. And those are chips that are in installed on your computer that are using it for hardware encryption. The next standard that we're going to talk about are the Rivest ones. So Ron Rivest of RSA fame, so RSA was Rivest, Shamir, and Aldman, um, made RSA. Ron Rivest came up with what he called the Rivest ciphers, or the RC. They were a series of symmetric ciphers. So starting in 1987, starting in 1987, he created this first Rivest 4, which was a stream cipher. It used a single round of encryption with variable key lengths between 40 and 2048 bits. And those are the basics for um, wired equivalent privacy or protection and WPA and the introductions of SSL and TLS. Those were starting with Rivest 4. So back in 1987 when we started those. Those were the first ways that we were doing standards or uh, ciphers with DES with Rivest 4. Rivest 5, completely different. This was a block cipher instead of a stream cipher. It also had variable block sizes. So instead of having a single block size, it had variable block sizes between 32 and 128 bits. And then again, the keys were from 0 to 2040 with 8 bits of parity hanging out in there. So it was completely unrelated to RC4. Our RC6 or RIVES6 is the next version of RC5. So it was 128 bit block sizes with again variable keys, 128 to 256 of symmetric keys. When they were trying to come up with AES, RIVES6 was one of the candidates. So one of the questions that you may have is which standards were possibly selected for, for AES but were chosen not to be because we're going to tell you about what they did pick for AES in a few seconds. But RIVES6 was one of the ones that was considered, but it was not actually selected in the end. So our current standards, our AES is the Rindell cipher, Rindall, excuse me, cipher. In October of 2000, NIST selected the replacement for DES because we knew DES wasn't working anymore. So the Rindell cipher was a block cipher. It used three key strengths of either 128, 192, and 256. The block size was equal to the key length. So if you had a 128 bit key, you would have 128 blocks, so on and so forth. And then the encryption rounds, remember how we talked about there being 16 rounds? Well, the encryption rounds were based on which key you picked. So if you picked a 128 bit key, you would run 10 rounds. If you picked the 256, you would run 14 rounds. And each of the different rounds were variable depending on what your key strength was. This is what has become the AES standard the advanced encryption standard, which we will discuss a little bit further. The CAST standard, which used the Feistel network, has 128 um, or 256, which uses a different number of rounds and a different number of key sizes. 
and the bit blocks. And then finally, we talked about where we talked about Blowfish from Bruce Snyder. He also created Two Fish, which was a block cipher with 128 bit blocks with keys up to 256. Two Fish was really interesting because it included pre whitening and post whitening, where we XORed a separate subkey before the first round and then a separate subkey after the 16th round. So you added in just a little bit more randomness thrown in there by XORing with a separate subkey. Okay, you're probably dying at the idea of me telling you all of these different bits and all of these different block sizes and why are they necessary. So looking at a comparison of each of these, yes, you actually do need to have some sort of memorization of all of these different encryption algorithms and what their block sizes are and what their key sizes are. Which ones are variable, which ones are static, which ones use a 64-bit a, a block, which ones use a 128-inch bit block, which ones use a variable block, which ones are stream versus block, all the different ones that are in here. You really do need to be aware of the different information on these different encryption algorithms. It's not that hard. It's it's kind of a difficult table to try to do so you can find some memoization or a mnemonics or some way to try to remember which one's which. If you can try to remember why they were created or who they were created by, that might help you. But yes, you do actually need to know every single name on this list, the block sizes and the key sizes that go with. All right, just a little bit longer. The next chapter or the next section is going to be on key management. How are you going to keep track of all of these keys? So three different ways that we have to deal with key management. You're in the security business. You need to understand how to manage your keys. First is creation and distribution. How are you going to get the keys where they need to be? Well, the first is the um, most obvious and yet the least useful is simply handing someone a piece of paper or a flash drive or talking over the phone, but essentially it's offline distribution. We are not going to send it over the internet, but this is kind of a pain. It's probably the most difficult and yet probably the most secure. I'm going to hand you a piece of paper, which you're going to memorize and then eat, um, you know, back to, to Mission Impossible days. Offline distribution simply means being able to get the key distribution to somebody easily without having to go through a electronic circuit. Now, since that's not really going to work for most people, public key encryption uses a public key to establish a secure connection first. And then once you have created that key, then you send or that that connection, you send the key. We're going to talk about this with asymmetric um, encryption in chapter seven, which will be the next slide or the next chapter. The other way of doing key distribution is Diffie-Hellman, which again, we will also cover in chapter seven. This is where used when both offline or public key encryption just won't work. You have to find Diffie-Hellman and Diffie-Hellman is a great way of being able to do that, which is implemented in a lot of different things going on right now. But again, chapter seven, we're not gonna spend too much time covering that in this chapter. With key management, you have to handle storage and destruction. So. Never store the key in the same place where the data resides, because then if they got hold of that, they could find the key and the data. Consider separation, two people, each with half of a key. And then there's storage options. You can do a software-based storage system, storing it on your local file system, or a hardware-based, like a flash drive or some sort of hardware security module, which will help to manage and keep track of all of your keys. So a couple of different things you can do with key management. And then comes the, what happens when you lose your key? key escrow recovery. So you can have what's called a recovery agent, which is someone who is assigned your key and they store it and they keep track of it. And when you say, I lost my key, they verify that you are who you are and then give you back your key. So you can register a recovery agent. You can use fair crypto systems, which is where the key is divided into two or more pieces and then given to independent third parties. Each party doesn't have the key themselves, but we put all of the information all together in one place and you can recreate the key. And then, of course, is the escrowed encryption standard, which is where the government has the technological means to decipher the ciphertext. This is that clipper chip that we talked about a little earlier. Most people in this industry are going to know about Moore's Law. Moore's Law simply says that the processing power of computing is going to double every two years. And it's done a pretty good job of doing that so far. There's some limitations on that, and we're wondering whether it will continue. There's some people who argue that it has started to slow down. All cryptographic systems, perhaps with the exception of a one-time pad, will become hackable eventually. Eventually, computers will be able to brute force your key the same way that we can now with the DES system. 
So your security needs to think about that concept when creating their system. Which algorithm will be used for the organization? Make sure that you identify the key lengths for each one and make sure you enumerate the transaction protocols like TLS as you go along. But the most important part about it is how secure do you need the data to be? And make sure you plan for the future, the possibility that at some point processing power will increase so much that the keys that you created 20 years ago are no longer secure. Are you going to recreate the keys with the newer versions as we go along with the AES, the D, triple DES, RSA, which different versions are you going to use? So in summary, thank you for sticking around. You need to understand how does confidentiality, integrity, and non-repudiation work in crypto systems, how the crypto systems can be used to achieve your authentication goals, be sure you're familiar with the basic terminology, what's the difference between code and a cipher, make sure you understand the basic types of ciphers, your transposition, your substitution, your stream, and your block, what is the requirements for a one-time pad, make sure that it is random, make sure that it is not repeated, when we do split knowledge or work function, make sure that those words mean something to you and that you understand them. Be able to describe the symmetric and the asymmetric crypto systems. All seven of the modes of symmetric crypto systems, so ECB, CBC, CFB, so on and so forth, make sure you know which ones are which and what they do. And make sure you have a basic understanding of AES and the different keys and block sizes of the different algorithms. Thank you for watching this chapter on the CISSP Chapter 6. I know it was a long one. Please come back next time for Chapter 7, where we'll get into public key environments and different asymmetric um, encryption types. Thanks. Have a great day.